title slide, which says where America shopped past tense for value. And that's the story of Sears Roebuck. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out on this, on this slide is this little, this little sign in, uh, this, in, in the photograph, there's a little sign that says 50% off sale. And that was one of the really wonderful things about Sears in their stores. Uh, in, in the main showroom, they always ran something for sale. And, and they were real sales. You know, 50% off is a, is, is a real, uh, sometimes a real bargain. Uh, so that was one of the uh, one of the really many wonderful aspects of the of the Sears story. I I always like to start stories about uh, that involve New Jersey, um, with uh, this gentleman here, John Cunningham, who was a mentor of mine. He's a great great uh, historian. He, he wrote quite a bit for the National Geographic. Um, if you are a if you are a long time Bell Telephone customer. Uh, John used to do a little feature in every month's bill. It was called Tell News, and he'd talk about history. Um, and then there was a, a great illustrator, also from New Jersey, named Harry Devlin, who used to do the illustrations for Tell News. But anyway, I got to know John, and, and one day he said to me, he said, you know, Jim, everyone in New Jersey is on the way. And, and I think this really speaks to our talk about uh, the industrial age. Uh, on the way, we're, we're, we're never sitting still in New Jersey. We're always going from one place to another, either by railroad, uh, earlier by canal, uh, by superhighway. We're always crossing the state. Now, if you go back, uh, let's say, oh, 100 years from John Cunningham, you'd come to a, a writer, a political writer by the name of John O'Sullivan, who was around at around the time of the Civil War. And he said that, that the whole continent was on the move. We were, we were destined to uh, cover the continent from sea to shining sea. It was our destiny as a people, our manifest destiny. And you may remember that, that, uh, that term from your high school civics class, manifest destiny. And if we went back another 100 years, uh, we come up to good old Ben Franklin. And Ben Franklin said that New Jersey was a beer keg with a tap at both ends. Uh, the uh, population is always running out either to New York every morning or to Philadelphia. Um, and, and that's true as well. Another thing that's, that's going to figure into our story today is the story of George Perro McCulloch. Uh, who was a Scotsman, lived in Morristown, New Jersey, and he envisioned a way to bring things across New Jersey from New York to Pennsylvania, and that was the Morris Canal, of which there's still little, little bits and pieces of it left. Um, here's a, a, a section of the Morris Canal, which is in Wharton, New Jersey, and, and it was really, it was a wonderful method, very cheap, although slow, method of moving goods from place to place. Um, and here is a, um, here's how they used to change uh, elevation using these locks, which were like, uh, I guess, like a bathtub, really. And you'd, and you'd push your, your canal barge in there, and then they would fill it up with water, and that would get you to the, to the next level. And the water for the Mars Canal came from Lake Hopatcon. Um, of course, the canals have been replaced by highways th these days. Here's a, a picture of, of Route 80. Um, but um, in between, there was a, a very uncomfortable time when the railroads came in. Railroads first replaced the canals. And uh, this is a picture, a really funny picture from New Jersey history of a, of a canal barge uh, running into a locomotive in Dover, New Jersey. This was around 1895. And uh, if you notice the, uh, the logo on the train, it says New York... Uh, Central and Hudson Line, and that was owned by none other than the Commodore uh, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt. So this was not a very good day for Vanderbilt uh, Enterprises. Um, another important character in this story is Stephen Vale, who was a, a, an ironmonger, and he, and he set up an ironworks in Morristown called uh, Speedwell. And Vale uh, was uh, was a hugely important. Uh, 19th century man. He, um, he built the first engines uh, for, the, for the first transatlantic steamship, 
which cut the time going from uh, from New York to Paris in um, it cut it in half. Uh, and here it is. This was it was it was a great. Uh, it was called the SS Savannah, and it was built right here in New Jersey. Very important moment in the Industrial Revolution. Um, Vale's son Alfred uh, went into business with none other than Samuel Morse. And they also at Speedwell, they invented the telegraph, which is a, another amazing uh, advance, which cut the time to communicate between New York and Paris from two weeks now down to two minutes. And it all happened right here. And here he is, Samuel Morse, a uh, great scientist of the time. Here's a picture of Chatham, New Jersey at around the time of the Civil War. And look at all the telegraph lines uh, running back and forth to New York and ultimately around the world. Throw another guy into the mix, and that's George Eastman. Uh, Eastman was from Rochester, New York. Uh, he set up a company that we're all familiar with called the Kodak Company. Uh, before he made the Kodak camera, he, um, <laughs> Eastman, was, uh, Eastman came up with the slogan first, which was, you press the button, We'll do the worst. We'll do the not the worst. We'll do the rest. Isn't that a great retail slogan? Thinking about what what the Sears would ultimately use. You press the button. We'll do the rest. And uh, the Kodak camera was very very important. This is uh, here's two uh, two lovebirds photographing each other with brownie cameras back in 1924. Uh, and you probably owned a brownie camera. It was it probably when you owned one. It was called the Instamatic or perhaps the 110 or the disc, uh, but they were all versions of this, this first very, very simple and cheap uh, box camera. And of course, things haven't changed. Uh, our social network is now made up with, uh, is done with the internet and cell cellular phones, um, but it's, it's always the same thing. People need to get together and they need to, in some way, shop remotely. Um, the postcard, very, very important way of communicating. Um, this is another story that I love to tell about a, um, an Amish farmer in, in uh, Iowa who uh, sent a postcard to the, um, to the CM Stark Company, uh, which had a produce contest every year. And this farmer, Jesse Hyatt, uh, sent a couple of his apples and a postcard to CM Stark. And when Mr. Smart Stark took a bite of the apple, he said, my, but that's delicious. And here we go. That becomes uh, the best-selling apple uh, in the United States for 70 years. Again, because of communication. Um, and another, uh, not a New Jersey guy, a man from Belgium, uh, a scientist named Leo uh, Beckeland, was, um, he was very uh, interested in creating varnish. And he actually uh, made photographic paper, which he sold uh, to Kodak. And, and, he had, uh, and he had his, um, his factory in New Jersey. And Backland uh, invented a type of varnish that he didn't like the outcome very much because it, it dried too fast and it was too hard. And little did he know, he had invented plastic, uh, which came to be known as Bakelite in those days. And uh, it was used for many, many different products here it's, uh, for a mantle clock, it was used for barware. It was even used for, for jewelry. Um, and so that, that adds to our um, uh, more things we can sell. Okay, let's start talking about uh, the Sears Company and its founder, Richard Warren Sears. Uh, Richard Warren Sears was from Minnesota, came from a wealthy family. He was a very, very sharp, ambitious young man. In fact, he became the youngest station master in the history of the railroads uh, in, in Minnesota. And he decided to come to Chicago to make his, his fortune. And uh, an interesting thing happened. In those days, um, it, actually quite often, uh, things would be left on the train and they'd go into a lost and found and then they, if they're valuable, they might be bid on. Well, someone left uh, a case of pocket watches. And Sears, um, Sears thought these would be a really good thing to sell. And uh, he charged uh, $5.87, uh, including postage, uh, which would uh, work out to about $160 today. So it was a pretty valuable watch. But he sold these watches uh, by the carload. 
and uh, he sold them. Uh, he advertised them in the newspaper, and he sold them by uh, by mail. Well, along came uh, uh, he got to know a, a watchmaker uh, by the name of Alva Roebuck, and Alva Roebuck became his partner, and that was the start of. Sears, Roebuck, and Company. Uh, and they didn't just sell watches, they started to sell several things. The, the problem with Mr. Roebuck was he was in tremendous debt and he didn't really bring anything to the business other than his name. And they liked that name, Sears Roebuck. It's, it's a great, uh, again, a, a great marketing name. And uh, so he, he was uh, kind of bought out of the company and he was replaced by a gentleman who had a lot more money, a fellow by the name of Aaron Nussbaum. Uh, there was one problem with Aaron Nussbaum is that nobody liked him. Uh, they, they liked him so little that there are no photographs available of Aaron, of Aaron Nussbaum, no matter how hard you, how hard you look. Um, so it, it, Mr. Sears couldn't wait to get rid of Mr. Nussbaum. And finally, he found the right partner, and that was Julius Ro Rosenwald. Rosenwald was not only rich, but he was a marketing genius. Uh, he was also a philanthropist. He, he started many fa foundations, and he's, he's known in America for that. Uh, but he became really the brains of, of Sears Roebuck. And the first idea that Rosenwald had was, let's not depend on the newspaper to, uh, to advertise our wares. Let's put a catalog in the mail. And they started out with the Sears Roebuck and Company catalog. It was a... Um, uh, it was wonderful, and, and it was kind of weird. It, it, it was small. It was, it was like the, the old-time TV guide or Reader's Digest. It was very thick. It had, you know, it had over 300 pages of items, but it was small, and people wonder, well, why would you want a, a small catalog? Why not a big catalog? Well, the reason, uh, or how uh, Rosenwald reasoned, was that um, when the mail is delivered and when it sits in your house, it's always stacked with the small stuff on the top. So everybody was sure to see the catalog, and, and, and he was right. Many, many years later, uh, Sears came out with a Christmas catalog called the Wish Book, and you may remember that, you know, and, and the kids absolutely loved the Wish Book. The Wish Book was, was thumbed through by every member of the family, uh, looking and hoping that Santa Claus might bring them something uh, from the Wish Book. Now, they didn't neglect uh, what we would now call brick and mortar stores. Um, they opened in Chicago a huge uh, department store. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of it. Uh, and here it is. And, and as the postcard says, one of the largest commercial buildings in the world occupied by one concern covers an entire block. And um, it, it was an enormous building. It included administrative offices, retail, and manufacturing space but most important, shipping. Because if you went around to the back of the building, you were right in the rail yards. Um, so you're ready to ship everything all over the country. Um, and this, of course, was, was genius. They also had, there was a Sears Tower. There was, there was a tower adjoining the building. It was 14 stories tall. And, and this will come into our, our story a little bit later. Uh, but that was the first uh, iteration of the Sears Tower. And Sears, as, as far as household uh, merchandise, it tried to become all things to all people. And I thought this was one of, one of the more unusual things that I, I didn't, never knew, um, that Sears uh, had the license to market um, Encyclopedia Britannica uh, for, for, quite, uh, for several, several years. And here is the, uh, the jaunty... Sears logo from 1923, from the height of, of the Roaring Twenties. There's that very nice, clean, uh, plain logo. Now, at this time, let's say between the wars, um, there, was, there was a move in the United States towards, uh, well, everyone owning a single family house, uh, you know, a house on its own green acre. And uh, of course, the, the great, great residential architect of the time was Frank Lloyd Wright. And he had a house style called Usonian, uh, which he felt was for the common man. But 
it, it was for a common man if you were, you know, like a millionaire. <laughs> it really was not possible for most Americans to own Usonian houses. Now, along comes a furniture designer by the name of Gustav Stickley. Uh, he was from Syracuse, New York, but he ended up in Morris County, New Jersey, uh, where he built the Craftsman or Craftsman Farms. And Stickley had a, um, a, a really good plan. It was a very democratic plan to, to um, disseminate house plans via a magazine. Um, and the houses, uh, the Stickley houses were, were like small versions of, of, the, um, of the Frank Lloyd Wright homes. And, and Stickley had a beautiful furniture line of, of a very plain, it's called mission style furniture. Um, he espoused a style called arts and crafts, it was an English style. Um, and here is, is Stick, Stickley's uh, estate in Mars Plains, um, Craftsman Farms. And as you can see, it's a, it's a large building, but it's built uh, to look like a, a log cabin. Uh, and he had a school there and he manufactured furniture. Um, here's a Stickley house, rather typical one, uh, made with, with several different um, building materials. Uh, this one was called, um, as you might guess from the, from the picture, it was called the Silver Birch. Here's, uh, here's one in Morris Township. Uh, this one, is, this was a Stickley bungalow. Bungalow was a, a style, uh, actually an English style. Uh, it, it came about when the, when the British went into India and the soldiers stayed there permanently. They built homes, small homes, and uh, they were uh, very open uh, because it was so hot in India. This was a, a very open style and it became really popular in the United States, especially for vacation homes. And again, you can see in this one uh, how the, the available materials are used, uh, all different materials to, to, to build these designs. Um, and here's Stickley's magazine called the, the Craftsman, which was his pride and joy. Um, the Craftsman not only included plans for houses, uh, but it also <laughs> included philosophy. And I thought this was pretty funny. Uh, and one of the articles in this one was Education, a Cure for Divorce. Uh, and another one, New Democratic Architecture in Holland, um, where I guess the architecture wasn't democratic enough. Um, the Craftsman name, however, and, and I, don't, I don't think there's any actual connection, except that the Craftsman name was used by Sears as well. And, and Sears started to design homes, uh, Craftsman homes, and they were called honor-built and ready-built homes. And, and their homes, well, they, they not only sold you the plan, but they revolutionized the business by selling you um, the actual materials you needed to build the home. Um, it was bungalow madness. Uh, Sears homes sprang up all over the country. Uh, you could order a Sears, a, a Sears plan. They would sell you all the materials. All you had to come up with, you needed a railroad near you to, to bring the stuff. And you needed a, a piece of property, obviously, and, and a foundation. You, you were in charge of the foundation. Everything else was included by Sears. And and here's the, the most popular one that we see in New Jersey. This was the, uh, the honor-built Sears Crescent. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the plans and the materials went for $1,783, um, which uh, I think I did a little calculation. Oh, a, a little bit more expensive uh, Sears house was $2,300, which would be worth about $35,000 today. Um, but they were superior. Uh, they're still around. They're very, very sturdy homes, beautifully built. Uh, the Crescent was a um, uh, was a, a lovely uh, design based on a Cape Cod, but it had a, a, a pretty fancy uh, porch with a crescent-shaped uh, opening in it. A little bit of history. The Crescent um, it, is 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 so popular that it becomes part of the building vernacular of the United States. And uh, this is a building in Morristown. This is next to the Ford Mansion or Washington's headquarters. And this is where uh, uh, some of the, uh, the in-laws of the Schuyler family lived. Uh, and at one point, 
uh, George Washington and Philip Schuyler uh, fixed up Washington's aide de camp, Alexander Hamilton, with one of the Schuyler daughters, her name was Betsy, and this became the Schuyler Hamilton house. Uh, this Hamilton story, of course, is, um, is made famous in the, in the great musical. But anyway, um, back in the 1930s, when Morristown was being um, rebuilt as a, as a uh, historic site, uh, historic national park, um, they really didn't know what this house looked like. And so they designed it, at least the porch, in the form of the Sears Crescent. So, of course, it's totally wrong, but they didn't know as much as they know now about uh, historic preservation and doing things uh, authentically. So the, the Sears Crescent shows up uh, in revolutionary history. Uh, here's a, a, a big one. This was called the, the Langston. And as you can see from the catalog page, they sent you lumber, hardware, plumbing, lighting fixtures, paint, millwork, uh, downspouts and, uh, and troughs, heating, uh, building paper and roofing, and wallpaper. So you got everything for $1,630. The Langston is a beautiful design called uh, a four square, and uh, they're all over the place as well. Here's one in Boonton, New Jersey. Uh, one of the wonderful things about the, the Langston design was it had that big wraparound porch, which people uh, during you know, Victorian times loved. Uh, they made a, uh, a Dutch colonial with a gambrel roof called the Oak Park. Uh, it's a lovely house, the offset front door. Uh, Sears also produced a big house called the Lexington, uh, a full-sized center hall colonial. Um, they even produced kind of a, a, a Spanish style or Mediterranean style house called the San Jose. Uh, and there happens to be one uh, right in Cedar Knolls. And you can see it was done with, with stucco, which really fits, fits the design. But you could use anything you wanted and you could change the design as much as you wanted. Um, and finally, uh, they had a very solid uh, Cape Cod, uh, which was always, always popular. And here's one. Uh, in a Sears Cape Cod in Madison. Well, around the country, 70,000 kits were sold uh, right up until the start of, uh, of World War II. So it was a tremendously, tremendously successful venture uh, for Sears Roebuck. Now, every house has a kitchen. Uh, in America, uh, a, a very popular style kitchen, of course, was the tenement kitchen. Uh, which we see in, in apartment buildings. There's so many apartment buildings in the urban areas of America. Um, the the, the, uh, the tenement kitchen was okay. It had a pass-through. It, um, it had a, a, a stove, which served also as heat in the sitting room. Uh, it was, it was well-lit. Um, it was not, however, a real pleasure to cook in. So Sears came up with their own kitchen, their kitchen ensemble, uh, ensemble with a, as it says, you can complete your ensemble with a chrome plated steel stool. So everything was, uh, everything was metal, stainless steel, uh, granite, uh, very beautiful, uh, beautiful kitchen designs. And you can see there that the lady of the house is so excited about her new kitchen uh, that she's, um, she's put on her high heels and had her hair done just to cook dinner. Isn't that amazing? And of course your house had to be protected. Uh, so one of the, uh, another uh, brand uh, that uh, Sears endorsed was Allstate Insurance, you're in good hands, which I believe is, uh, is still their, uh, their slogan. Houses uh, need to be decorated and they need artwork. Uh, so Sears actually uh, set up a, a service where they sold paintings. Uh, but they weren't just uh, machine made or, uh, or mass produced. They were original works of art by real artists. And their spokesperson was Vincent Price. I thought that was pretty cool. I didn't, I didn't know that Vincent Price was doing advertising in those days, but sure enough. Um, here's the, uh, a, a, a real strong logo from, from 1963. And at this point, 
Sears, uh, Sears owned the world. They, they, they were really in charge. Everything was firing on all cylinders. And the owners of Sears felt that that, that little tower they had was not big enough. They wanted something really big. And so they hired uh, one of the real, really world-renowned architects who was based in Chicago, a fellow by the name of Bruce Graham. And he brought in this plan. Uh, and, and all the executives scratched their heads. What the, what the heck is this? This doesn't look like anything. It looks like a tic-tac-toe board. Um, but Graham explained that um, this cubicle shape would be uh, the cross-section of a, a, a beautiful new very modernistic Sears Tower. And if we look at it from the side, this is what it was. Uh, it was actually uh, five different size cubes, uh, some as low as 50 floors, uh, others going up to uh, the 108th floor. So it was, it was a very, very uh, complex plan and it was beautiful. Um, it en encompassed uh, 4.56 million square feet which is 105 acres of floor space. And here's what it looked like going up. Uh, no, no visible cement or brick. It was um, stainless steel and black glass. Now, at exactly the same time, uh, over in New York City, um, Yamasaki had designed the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers, and that was going up. And, and the two, the two structures, um, pretty much were were built and and topped out at the same time. Interestingly, um, the uh, the World Trade Center ended up being about eighty feet shorter than the Sears Tower. So, for once, the uh, the second city, Chicago, became the first. And here's the completed tower which for 45 years was the tallest building in the world. Well, by 1994, by the 1990s, um, the economic uh, environment uh, had changed. Uh, we were starting to see all kinds of, of, of different stores. Sears had, had more or less found a niche uh, in the malls. Uh, that's general, and then there were often anchor stores uh, in, in the malls. Um, very interestingly, they dropped the catalog. Now, you have to understand that Sears was Amazon way before Amazon was Amazon. Uh, Sears had a really, really good shipping system. Uh, they had a great way to merchandise items. Um, they, they, as many of us, uh, they did not see the internet coming. Um, and they didn't see their future in, in mail order. Um, and here's a, here's a wonderful uh, New Yorker cartoon that I think says it all. And it's these two, two businessmen having a, having a three martini lunch. And the one says to the other, trust me, Mort, no electronic communication superhighway, no matter how vast and sophisticated, will ever replace the art of the schmooze. Well, were they wrong. Uh, the schmooze was over and the internet was in. Even Kodak, uh, one of the most successful, innovative companies in American history, the company that invented the digital camera, uh, went out of business. Worse still, uh, Sears decided to move into a, a little higher level of clothing, and they bought a, a, a very good company and some, that made beautiful sportswear called Land's End. Uh, but Land's End turned out to be um, a, a complete uh, a complete failure. To add insult to injury, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average of the 30 uh, top stocks, Home Depot nudged Sears out of the Dow Jones. Um, and of course, Home Depot was a, a great, great competitor for uh, the Sears, uh, you know, the building stuff. Kmart did come to the rescue and bought out Sears. Uh, so the Sears logo um, added this, uh, this red, red swoosh. 
Um, but it, it, it's, it still wasn't enough. Um, the, the Sears, st in, in all the malls, uh, the Sears, again, off in the anchor store, uh, the Sears started to close. And we went from, if I have the numbers here, uh, we went from uh, 3,700 locations at their peak um, down to 434 uh, in 2018. Um, the Craftsman Tools, however, uh, the line still flourished. It was taken over by um, Black & Decker. And one of the, the great selling points of the Craftsman Tools was that the hand tools, like screwdrivers, hammers, things like that, had a full lifetime warranty. And that, believe it or not, is still honored. Um, here's uh, one of the more recent uh, the more recent logos. Um, this is a, a, a type of logo which has become very, very popular. It's this, this little, uh, using these little icons. And here's the ones for uh, Airbnb, uh, you know, bed and breakfast and, and Rothy shoes. I personally don't understand what it means. To, to me, this here's one, it looks more like an ad for the natural gas company to me. So, what really was the downfall of Sears? Well, it was a lot of things. Um, it was the, the, the growth of these other stores, uh, Amazon taking over the mail order, uh, mail order market, uh, Walmart. Well, Walmart just grew and grew. Uh, if we look at a, at a chart of Walmart versus Sears uh, from 1994 to 2004, uh, the, the Walmart kept building and building stores in every town. Sears, as you can see, uh, their level of uh, new stores remained uh, remained level, remained constant. You can't have in big business. You 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 can't um, you can't stand still. There there has to, there has to be growth um, uh, for the stock to grow. So here's our um, here's here's our uh, uh, timeline of of Sears. Um, hello. We're not moving forward here. There we go. And then we start coming into modern times. And then uh, for one brief shining moment, they went back to a, um, a vintage logo for their 125th anniversary. And here we are today. <laughs>